Hey everyone, you ever feel like you're trapped inside of a movie or a story that you can't control but you can't seem to get out of and everyone around you seems to know exactly what their role is and who they are and what they're doing and you seem to be at the whims of all these other forces? This is kind of what our film for this week, Cabin in the Woods, asks us to think about. In our last two films, Cabin in the Woods and then next week's The Prestige by Chris Nolan, we're looking, about, we're looking at films that are about film not just about the technicality of film. You'll see that a lot. They're going to kind of wink to other movies in certain ways. But about how the story, the images, and the sound on the screen relate to the people in the audience, and then how the people in the audience go out and actually live in a real world. Cabin in the Woods specifically is asking us to think about that dynamic. Okay, um, And it's mostly a horror film. It delves into some other genres. But I want to start thinking about how horror films function a little bit to get us into Cabin in the Woods. And then I'll ask us to think about a couple specific ideas about the film. I beg you, please, please, please go look at my written out lecture on Cabin in the Woods. I ask a bunch of questions there that I really think can get us to the heart of how this movie functions. And I hope that you'll consider those in your weekly paper and your discussion questions. All right. Let's get going. First things first, this is a film by Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard. You guys might know those names. Joss Whedon has been one of the most important sort of entertainers or filmmakers for the last 25 years or so. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, uh, Firefly Serenity, a really remarkable show called Dollhouse. He's also the director of the first two Avengers movies. Um, so again, a pretty big name. Drew Goddard, um, some people might know him from... Uh, what's that show called? It's another comic book superhero thing. Um, Daredevil on Netflix. He's also the executive producer of a TV show called The Good Place, um, a sort of goofy, quirky um, television comedy about philosophy and the afterlife and many other things. Um, so those guys really got together, trapped themselves in a hotel room for a couple days, and wrote this movie. And it's kind of their love letter to the horror genre, as well as their hope for what the horror genre can be doing in the future. So, let's back up a little bit. Horror films have a horrible reputation. They're usually seen as B-rate, schlocky, horrible, stupid, unintellectual crap for sadists who like to watch people's bodies ripped open and, and sort of have people bathing in blood or whatever. Well, they might be that, but they're also much, much, much more than that. Um, I could give you a history straight back to our very first films, us uh, up to contemporary horror films, but I just want to talk about the last couple decades or so and sort of talk about the types of horror films we have and what they might be doing. That's kind of the more important question, I think. Um, on a sort of grand scale, most horror films are about death, right? And so they're asking us to consider and to confront are the moral coil. I mean, I am going to die. I'm going to be food for worms. Um, this body is going to stop working at some point. And, you know, we have, well, I was gonna say, who knows what happens next, but, you know, some people have ideas, etc. But most horror films are about fragility, the fragility of our bodies, the fragility of our social structures, the fragility of our own hopes and fears and desires. And in psychological horror, uh, the fragility of what we think of our own minds and how potentially unstable we might actually be. Um, then there's the Stephen King version that I talked about earlier this semester with Shawshank Redemption. The idea that, well, there's tons of scary crap around us and, and let's actually think about how scary it might be. Uh, anything from high school to cars to war to, as I mentioned before, the bathroom. Tons of things that could be exploited for their um, fear. Some horror films, though, are very much about a way of thinking. Man, it's dangerous or scary to think like this. So let's do a horror film that exploits that mental process or that ideology. Um, and then there's horror films that are more about warnings. Man, if you act or think this way, a crazy killer is going to come and, and sort of do horrible things to you. Sorry, I was going to give a very graphic description of that, but I figured I, I'll, I'll, I'll save you. I'll save it for the film itself. I'll let the horror film kill people in horrible ways. All right, so those are some big ideas that horror films have been playing with since their inception, but really uh, in the last 30 years or so. What I want to spend a second talking about is the Cabin in the Woods film or the, the slasher film from the late 70s and the early 80s. You hopefully have seen some of these sorts of things, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, any film where typically... A bunch of teenagers are going to go out and have a good time, and then there's one or two crazy killers 
who are going to punish them for having a good time. And there's usually backstories and other ideas happening. But the main thrust of these types of films tend to be young people are scary. They have too much freedom in the contemporary world. Uh, they're going to drink. They're going to get high. They're going to have sex. And we don't like that. So we need someone to torture them, someone to punish them, someone to show them how dangerous those activities are. If you've ever seen the original Halloween, it's the virgin that survives. Everyone else gets murdered. Um, this thing gets sort of played out a lot. But maybe they're more subtle, more dangerous than this. Imagine something for me. And it's towards the end of the semester, so I hope I can have a little leeway to uh, talk about some pretty creepy things. You might have seen this film or this scene in a film before. There's a young woman. She's miraculously beautiful. She's probably a pop star or she's a model or she's someone you've seen in other media as well. Or she looks very similar to those women. She'll be running through the woods. Uh, it's dark. It's the middle of the night. You will hear her panting and hyperventilating. She, of course, will fall because someone's chasing her. Um, quick side note, and this might sound a little misogynistic. Uh, how is it that people who can walk in heels really well can't run through the woods in tennis shoes? See what I'm saying? It's a wildly unrealistic portrayal of women, the way the horror genre tends to work, or at least these older horror films. Miraculously, women sometimes fall on their backs. I've run. I, if you ever, you've seen me, I, I'm the most uncoordinated person in the world. I walk and I fall. I have run and fallen. Never once in all of my many years of falling down have I fallen on my back. You follow me? I always fall on my stomach. But I think the way the horror film works, these slasher films, they could be exploitative. They could be purposefully exploiting the female body for sexual purposes. So our very beautiful blonde is running through the woods. A crazed killer is coming after her, typically with some sort of overgrown uh, phallic image, right? Not a pen, uh, a machete, a spear, something like that, a chainsaw. Um, and our, our lovely girl, who probably is drunk, maybe high, she might have had sex this weekend, all of these um, moral issues that we're worried about in American culture, especially in the 70s and 80s, she falls on her back. Somehow, miraculously, her uh, shirt falls off or flips open, and her breasts are exposed to the cold uh, winter air or the nice summer air or whatever. Um, and this is when the really disturbing stuff happens. If you think about these images and these sequences, we then see this woman on her back, semi-naked, exposed, making faces, usually out of terror or dread. You know, you change the music to a scene like this, and you don't have a horror scene. You actually have something closer to pornography. The face is being made, the sound's being made, she's on her back, etc. Now, here's where it gets really, really, really gross. There's usually a scene in which someone will stab this woman or torture this woman or murder this woman. And what will happen 89% of the time, we'll see the woman and then we'll see the space next to her. It might be snow, it might be leaves, it might be dirt. And then we'll see blood uh, sort of splattered onto that other space. Um, this is something that also mimics pornography. To be sort of academic and straightforward with this, the murder scene in many slasher films mimics the sexual climax for a male, okay? And some people say that's horrible and gross and exploitative and it's meant to be pleasurable to watch those moments. Other people say it's showing people how gross male sexuality, toxic male sexuality can be in that it might want um, heterosexual male sexuality might want women in positions of low power, low authority, where they are dominated and controlled. And maybe even this goes back to Edgar Allan Poe, who said the death of a beautiful woman is the most beautiful thing ever. That's not an exact quote, but that was the idea. Um, so this film that we're going to deal with plays with those conventions, um, those ideas, and I think really messes them up and hopefully messes us up as we're watching this, right? So, some specific things that happen in Cabin in the Woods and horror films that we want to look at. First is the script. Many times, these scripts are atrocious. They are horrible. They, it's almost as if they had never actually hung out with teenagers, and they give teenagers the stupidest ideas, the stupidest lines. I know many teenagers. I'm a college professor. These are really smart, subtle, cool, brilliant people. Um, very passionate, powerful people at times. Uh, but not according to most, you know, uh, horror films. These are idiots. 
Um, or if there's a smart person, he's known as the brain or the dork, the geek, etc. Um, so look at the script, especially in Cabin in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods is aware that it's a horror film. And it's talking to the audience, kind of winking at the audience, saying, we know we're in a horror movie, right? And we know we're talking about other horror movies, right? Aren't horror movies stupid and funny? Cabin in the Woods seems to know all of this and play with those conventions. So think about the scripts that these characters tell. As I mentioned before, the characters in Cabin in the Woods, at least on one level, know they're in a story. They know they're in a horror movie. And sometimes their lines are being scripted for them, and they know it. Um, the hero will give a big speech. You're going to see Chris Hemsworth. This is freaking Thor giving a speech about how he's going to save everybody. This is a convention. We understand this speech. We've seen it 10,000 times. And even the character knows he's giving a speech as he's giving a speech. So how the script works. The character tropes that we see. We're going to see a very wildly sexualized blonde. We're going to see a little subtle demure um, woman. We're going to see lots of hot men in different ways. There's the sports hot guy. Well, they're kind of both sporty. But then there's the brain hot guy. And then there's the kind of the funny, shaggy character from Scooby-Doo, the kind of the burnout, the, the pot-smoking guy in the corner, who's pretty smart, intelligent, might even understand more than anyone else in the whole damn movie. But because he seems goofy and silly, his intellect, his intellect isn't taken as seriously. Um, and we're going to see those character types really exploited and, and played with and talked about. Um, there's one character in the film specifically early on who makes a phone call and he's supposed to be the creepy old guy who knows all the young kids are going to die um, in a horror film. So think about the characters in the script and how the characters themselves seem to know they're inside the story and why that might be important. Music and horror films. Go back to Psycho. Typically very soft, very quiet, and then all of a sudden really freaking loud, very violent and aggressive. So see how uh, Cabin in the Woods plays with that convention. Lastly, the camera in the horror film. One of the ways we can create tension with a camera is to give us a close-up and then to give us space with no people in it and then give us a close-up, again, of, of a person's face. What it does is it makes us feel like there's something in that space next to us. Here's something you probably have seen. Middle of the night, uh, maybe a 15-year-old girl wants to go downstairs and get a glass of water. We will watch her walk down the stairs step by step, subtly creaking. And in a horror film, when it's quiet, every tiny little sound becomes filled with tension. So we watch her feet go down the stairs. Then she walks into the kitchen. And maybe, eh, maybe she doesn't want water. Maybe she wants ice cream now. So she opens up the freezer door. And all we see, the camera shows the side of her face, some Ben & Jerry's ice cream, and the freezer door. And the, the terror is, because we can't see beyond the other side of that freezer door, is there a killer there? Is there a monster there, etc.? And then, nine times out of 10, she's gonna close the freezer door, nothing's going to be there. Because by now, we know as a horror movie audience that that's a convention that horror movies use. And now the tension has been tripled, and we're going to expect some monster or creature to sort of be there and get her. Um, so think about how the, the camera is gonna show close-ups and then blank spaces, and then close-ups again. That sort of editing rhythm is gonna happen a lot. Um, I'm not going to do a post-viewing lecture this time uh, because I really, again, as we move through the course, I want more of your answers. So I apologize, and not just for this video, if it's okay, I mean, I'll apologize that for the last couple lectures, last few weeks, I've been being less and less specific about the films themselves. Because again, my goal is, now that you understand more about film form, now you understand more about theme and cultural work, I very much want you to be exploring what you think is important throughout the week, and then I'll chime in and add things that myself or other film scholars have talked about. Thank you so much, guys. Something just happened here. Um, thank you so much, guys. I really look forward to seeing your discussions this week of Cabin in the Woods. We're almost there.